Hey, Trisha. Hi, Corey. What's the matter with you today? Oh, just been that kind of day. Hey, welcome to the, welcome to the Cheshire cast. I'm I'm Corey. And I'm Trisha. Because, see, we don't use titles anymore. Just today. You'll use them again next no. week. There's no pattern. No. There's no, no pattern to no. you, Corey no. Nash. No. There is. I think I, I like to think I'm an easy guy to figure out, but I am, I'm not. You, if you don't even know that the answer to that question, don't ask me. No, it was a question. I know. If you don't know the answer to that question, then... No? No. What'd you do all day? So many things. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Too many <laughs> things. You know what I've been doing a lot of? No. Organizing plans for the next two weeks. Uh. <laughs> like doctor's appointments, holiday plans, oh, oh. errands... Stu- just it wasn't like a I'm getting ready to get ready thing. No, so okay. much stuff. And then the cars and the ice and the kids and school and mm-hmm. doctors. and mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what I did all day. It's probably yeah. why I'm tired and sleep well either. I did something funny today. I meant to bring it up on the show. I can't. I still can't remember what it was now. Did you slip while you were doing No, no. You only did one funny thing and you told yourself to remember and can't remember Well, it. I, I did multiple funny things, but it was this one in particular that I told myself to remember for the show and I blanked out as soon as the doorbell rang. <laughs> well, you still got to bring it up. <laughs> well, I'm hoping that... Uh, it'll trigger? Yeah, that it'll it'll jog my brain a little bit. Does it have to do with baseboards? Uh, no. No, it doesn't have to do with baseboards. Um, so, I don't know. I'll re- I'll remember. What what are you saying under your breath? I I can't. What? I already forgot the the long O. <laughs> oh oh oh! So oh, oh. I'm so mad. I think I need vitamins. We'll, I need like we'll get pronunciation we'll, vitamins. We'll get Do they make those? Ginseng, ginkgo biloba. I kind of can't wait till you <laughs> announce our guest today. I kind of it's gonna be awesome. Oh man! You know what I did? I caught up on all of our episodes. I had a lot of driving to do this week with um, all appointments. Of them? Well, I was behind. Just because I haven't, like, I've been homebound, uh, and, uh-huh. and I was doing a lot of car rides, so I caught up, and I just laughed a lot. We're funny. You know, it's good to listen back to what you're doing, because it helps you get better. Yeah. Like, I also, I appreciate your editing. I yeah. do. Yeah. I do. Not just the skill, not just the technique from, be, from like, a year ago to now, but mm. what you choose to leave in and take out, I appreciate the choices. Because when you listen back, you go, oh. Oh, he skipped all over that whole yeah, thing. <laughs> absolutely. And I've always appreciated you leaving out the stuff that I'm like, maybe that shouldn't be in. But now I've just come to expect it. So yeah, well, but now I'm like, yeah, that's. I he, think he did that without me saying anything. I think it allows for us to have a, a fun conversation, yet realize that if we go somewhere that may not be the best for our guest. Or for, for us. Or for just the listener. Yeah. yeah. Then, then you Cut know. it out. And some things, you know, there's there's certain uh, uh, lefts and rights that we take that don't really add anything. And some that really need to stay in. Yes. Yeah, yeah. there's definitely some inside jokes that... That's a lot of pressure on you, I think. Yeah. Well, you know. And the editing has gotten seamless. Like, episodes ago, I don't know, let's go back, 45 episodes ago, you would have little... Like uh, you could you could hear yeah. when you cut and when you start it again when you put the well, two I, scenes I learned together. That if you if you actually zoom in to the wave file on Pro Tools, you can get really re- you can really fine tune where you're cutting. Well, it it's apparent. Yeah, it's so good. I didn't realize that I could get and and it helped too that I got like a larger monitor. You're such a techie. So now I can. Are you getting tech for Christmas? Uh, I, I hope I get money so I can spend it on tech because I don't want people <laughs> to buy tech. One. Yeah. Yeah. I had these really small screens before, like 20 inch, and now I've got like 20, thir- 30 inch screen. You're literally seeing sound. Yes. You're visually working with sound. That's kind of cool. Yeah. So, you know, it's fun. That's And, and that segues right into our guest. Look at that. How come everybody ruins the segue? Like, you don't have to announce the segue, but you set it up just right. I could have just rolled right in. We were just talking about editing. You take it out. But everybody, no, I'm going to leave it in now. Everybody steps all over the segue. All the time. It's like becoming a thing. It's it's like, let's find the segue and then step on it. I didn't step on it. I gave it a little, I held the door for it. That's all. Well, today's guest 
is a professional sound engineer. Mm-hmm. Uh, he travels quite extensively. He's from right here in town. His name, Trisha. Trisha why don't you do the introduction? Ryan Drowsed. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> Drozed. Drozd. Ryan Drozd. Ryan Drozd. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Thank you guys so much for having me. Welcome to the studio. I'm like 0 and 10 for name pronunciations. Uh, no, you, you, th- this was the first miss in a while. Drozd. Drozd. People Drozd. see the Z followed by the D and they just forget how the, to The speak. Z and the D was yeah. perfect for me. It was the, the five different ways you can pronounce the O. <laughs> and enough. I always pick the wrong one no matter how I can well, like, I channel always, it all I day. I set you up before we turn the microphones on. As I'll say it like 15 different ways. <laughs> and that's I do that on purpose. My brain like short circuits the second I have to say it. It's like panic. Say it's, it wrong. It's not my voice that does it? No. No. Despite okay. despite all your efforts, I would do it with or without you, Corey. <laughs> so Ryan is a pro sound guy, and like, and does it for a living. Yeah, no, well, yeah, but yeah, you. I mean, you could be a weekend warrior sound guy for a living. Uh, you could be a hack sound guy for a living. There's a lot of those. There are. <laughs> um, I think to get the pro sound guy. Um, you have to have a fairly decent resume and you have to have worked in some of the best rooms around the world, I think. I'd say that's fair. Um, which you've done. Yes. And, uh, you know, just, just a little bit. Let's see, uh, reading off of his resume. His he, CV. He's worked as a tour manager, as a front of house engineer, as a production manager, a monitoring uh, monitor engineer. Have I missed anything? No, I, I think I, I nailed it all there. Um, locally, you've worked at College Street Music Hall at Toad's Place uh, for Horizon Sound out in Shelton, yep. which does uh, a multitude of different live events, like anything from uh, uh, like street races to um, large scale. Um, outdoor events they um, do the uh, summer series down in hamden every summer the summer series which is the concerts on the uh, old golfing uh, uh golf course um, outdoor music but you've toured with numerous artists uh i've been following you on facebook and <laughs> I, I watch your uh your travel haikus Just watch me ping pong around the country yes it's like leaving bradley to LAX to... It's a lot of traveling in the music industry. Oh, there's w- there's way too much traveling in the music industry. The, there's a lot of traveling and then there's downtime, right? Like there's... It's like a... Extremes. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of downtime um, if you're not the tour manager, I would say, um, which I'm not unfortunately. I'm, I'm a tour manager as well as an audio engineer. So when I finish a tour, I'm either... I've already started working on the next tour while I'm on the previous tour. So you have to and go then, and look at places and... Yeah, then I, okay. I, I go home to my office and I set up everything for the next tour and make sure everything will be honky-dory. Yeah, he's one of the guys in the group that does almost all of the or most of the busy work. So that the artist can get on stage, perform, get off stage, eat or drink, and then go to sleep. Exactly. <laughs> the tour managers, uh, I mean, tell us a little bit about what a, T, a, a TM does. I, I know, but I want our <laughs> tell guests. Tell us some to. of the, the orchestration Explain. you're doing. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm essentially a glorified adult babysitter, more or less. Um, it's a lot of dealing with with personalities on the road and managing a crew and managing the artist and the band members. Um, But I do everything from booking all the airfare to booking all the hotels uh, to making sure every last bit of travel is squared away to advancing with every single uh, venue that's on the tour to make sure that they have everything that we need to put on the best show possible for the audience down from audio to transportation too, like cars to and from and not only all transportation, but of the equipment as well. I'm assuming whether yep. the bass player likes Avion water versus Poland Spring versus cherry sparkling cherry versus what kind of cherries versus are they taking the money for the catering as a heard, buy buyout or I heard an yeah. artist say a really interesting <laughs> quote like uh, somebody asked for like arbitrary name here, but like blue M and M's. You can like, tell the Van Halen story. The brown is that M&Ms. it? Yes. <laughs> But it, it was Van Halen, brown M&M's. But it was, they said that. No brown that, M&M's. They said, 
is that yep. did, did i hear that here you're keep going you're going you're, you're right so it wasn't that he was that particular but it was that's how he told he he was reassured the quality of the tour that he was on by what details were followed correct was that said that's here absolutely correct or did i hear that somewhere else no you heard it here oh, okay I heard it here first, and that and that's absolutely correct. Where, you know, and that's a detail you would have to monitor. Absolutely, we actually have something like that uh, with one of the artists that I work for uh, on our rider. Um, we split our hospitality up into even days and odd days, so we don't get the same thing every day over and over again. Um, but one of the things on there is either uh, a hand drawn picture of an animal wearing a funny hat um, as an inspirational post- uh, poster. Um, or uh, an original, an, an original inspired quote um, that's supposed to be framed and set up on where we have all the green room snacks set up, essentially. Hmm. And if I don't see that when we roll in, I know that there's something else that's gonna ha- w- would have been missed throughout the rest of the day. Eye for detail. Yep. So now you're on edge trying to figure out what it is. Yeah, well, <laughs> you're waiting for the other shoe so to o- fall. O- occasionally, I'll get an email when I when I advance the show that. Um, they're not going to do that, but they read it and they think it's funny. And yep. then I'll just be like, okay, at least I know that you've, it was a you've read my entire picture. Email. Nobody drew it. <laughs> what else is going to go wrong? Well, I don't know. Maybe a photocopy, a photocopy picture would suffice. I, I mean, I would or, be fine with a photocopy picture. or shows that they cut corners. Hmm. Mm, I don't. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. You know, but it's good to have little tests like that when yes. you're. Well, I don't. <sighs> One of the reasons I was excited to have you on is I don't believe that a lot of our listeners and a lot of the general public understands what goes into putting on a concert behind the scenes. I th- I think sometimes that people think bands just pop. Well, here we are. <laughs> the, we're on stage. The curtain goes up and there they are. And, and they're playing and they don't understand that sometimes that 15 minute delay isn't because the singer's being a jerk. It's because there's a line that is broken between, you know, this cable and that cable that's not communicating. And you've got eight guys trying to figure it out and it runs like a small army. So, so I mean, for example, College Street Music Hall. One of my bands played there Saturday night, December 14th, Kings and Liars. Uh, Right before Rat went on, the lights went out. The lighting system completely failed. I actually read about that on Facebook from the LD that works at College Street Music Hall. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm there with Charles and Ian and the team. And, you know, I start seeing the lighting guy freaking out, rightly so. But then you start to realize that there's a chain of command and there's an order. Now you have chaos. So you have one guy communicating with one guy who's communicating with the next guy. You don't have eight guys piled on top of each other trying to figure it out. 15 minutes later, the lights came on. Band comes back, starts again. All things go. But before every set, you've got to change, you know, your, your I don't know the technical term, but soundscape. Uh, basically, you you change you change your show file from from your settings from one band, and then you load a new file which has all of your settings for the next band. At least in the new digital digital world, right. you couldn't do that with analog. You just have to you have to Sounds literally so chart easy. every single knob that's on the console and fader position, and then tr- reset it manually with by hand. And I'm well, happy that we're not there <laughs> in the '60s. Technology, you, yeah. Well, in the in the '60s, you'd have to remember, yep. or have a notebook. And hope that that notebook doesn't disappear, just like you hope when you load your sound file, <laughs> it works. You just put like a paper over it with markers on it. Just turn it to that marker. That, well, that's what they do. But people can walk away with the paper, and they probably did, or spilled coffee on it, or God knows what. And now, okay, now everything's on a thumb drive. So occasionally you'll lose your thumb drive, and if you don't have that, <laughs> then you don't have a show. And there's no backup for a thumb drive. That's that's why most You're like, most, I have most two. professionals have at least two. <laughs> What's yeah. your horror story? Oh, in terms of what? I have way too many horror stories. Well, I want to hear an artist horror story. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Are you loud? Yeah, I just won't name any names. Um, yeah, keep it professional. We don't want you to not get hired. <laughs> um, so I was working for uh, an artist, and they were rather particular um, about everything. Um, and they were uh, well on the up and up. Um, and they didn't like walking outside in front of fans a whole lot. Um, so we had to park our bus right outside the venue. Um, but there was a fire hydrant that was directly across from the stage door. 
So we had to keep our bus parked back about 20 feet. They wouldn't go on stage unless the bus was moved forward 20 feet um, because otherwise they would have to walk in front of fans that were waiting outside the bus. And I could see <laughs> in, the ref- artist, in the artist's defense, uh-huh. right? Let's just going in front of fans maybe caused an anxiety or a stress and pulled them out of there. You really, performing is like, you have to be in the, in the moment, in the zone. And if walking in front of fans pulls you out, I could see how you would be like, no. I, I understand that to a point, but this was a tour where there's also like hired security um, and everything was, was roped off more or less. And it was a very quick entry. It would have taken all of about four seconds. It must be hard to be in that industry and be stressed out by fans. It must be hard. It's for everybody involved. Yeah. I, I'm, I feel bad. For, I, I felt bad for the, that tour manager at the time for having the patience to put up with just you got to make it happen. Very small requests like that. Yeah. Well, well, at that point, you have to call the, the the bus driver who's already asleep in their hotel room that's two blocks away to come back to the venue to just turn on the bus and move it forward 20 feet. Yeah, it's not like every anybody can just get in the bus and Sounds move like it. Sounds like just absolute organized chaos. Abs- that's exactly yeah. what it is. It's it, organized it, chaos. The tours, especially as they get up to the level that Ryan works at, uh, there, there could be... 50 people traveling with this show just for <laughs> as far as organizational or, or musicians and, and uh, outside of people. the band itself okay yeah yeah the the tour was on the summer uh the artist i work for his name's alan stone we were on tour with train and the goo goo dolls um for their big giant summer headline tour um i think everyone between bus drivers crew and band members i believe the final head count was 87 people on the tour 87 people that's, I mean... And all technicians, not even all artists. There's technicians. There's, I mean, in every aspect you, of professionalism. Yeah, you, you go all the way from guitar tech and drum tech, backline tech, people running the playback, people driving the buses, people... Personal drive, assistants. Per, per, exactly, personal assistants, tour managers, assistant tour managers, production managers, production assistants, And you have to make sure designers. everybody's getting along and doing what they have to do. Yep. There's, uh-huh. And there's even like, you can, <laughs> you can break it down even further uh, to there's like, just for audio, there's uh, audio engineers that are specific to the band. And then there's, um, there's audio engineers that are specific to each station. So front of house or monitors. Uh, and then there's uh, an entirely separate audio company that is in charge of hanging the liner APA every single day and breaking it down and delegating the work out to the local stagehands. I believe the... Yeah. And then the, you're dealing with the venue. Yeah. The, the, the labor call too. on that tour was, I want to say about 40 people between just union staffing and loaders and stagehands and everything. <laughs> so all in to put on one show for about four hours is about 120 to 130 people for something of an, an, an amphitheater to arena size scale. Mm-hmm. Ideally, who's the most important aspect of that that you're trying to keep happy fan or musician? Both <laughs> simultaneously. Yeah. Uh, I mean the, I mean, the the artist is always trying to make make it so that the audience is having the best experience as, as possible. So you do want to make sure that they do have the best experience. But if the artist is having a bad time, the the art the audience is not going to have a good time. No, a la Guns and Roses in St. Louis. Who just got in trouble for right? constantly it was being ninety three? That happened. I honestly don't know what you're referencing. Oh, really? Yeah. The uh, St. Louis incident with Guns and Roses where they. I think they played uh, like three songs and then stormed off stage and there was a riot and <laughs> basically the entire arena got torn apart as well as a lot of their instruments and so forth. Some, somebody just got in a lot of trouble for like consistently being two hours late or something. It just made the news. Like the artist is com- consistently two hours before they step on stage. Somebody big. I believe that was Madonna. I think it, I think it was recently. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, somebody was trying to sue her because uh, they were stating that when they buy a ticket, they're entering a contract with that audi- with that artist to appear on stage at the time that was advertised. Ooh, that would set a precedent. Yeah. Um, I don't think they're going to have a case for that. It's in process, you're saying? Yeah. Interesting. Because yeah. they're, you know, there's a, there's a kind of like a stereotype with big artists that they, 
I don't know. I don't know if it's an ego stereotype or, you know, they just show up on stage however they want to. It's not always the case. There are very some very conscientious artists. I think it's an individual thing. That's definitely the case. There's also, um, that can also fall upon a tour manager if they're not making sure that their artist is getting to where they need to be at the same, at the Right, you at have the to like trick time. the time. Yeah. You like have to tell them that they're supposed to be on stage two hours before they're really I mean, supposed I, to be. I <laughs> mean, I do that with a lot of the artists I work for. Listen, is however if, it if works. If I say we need to be in the lobby for our our transportation to bring us to the airport or uh, something at if we really need to be there at eight o'clock i'll tell them seven forty. well now they know now you just now you just blew your cover <laughs> uh oh <laughs> now they're all gonna be 20 minutes late <laughs> none of them none of them are gonna none of them are gonna listen to this <laughs> great thanks <laughs> well thanks for the vote of confidence right you can go now Thanks for the share. <laughs> Thanks, bud. I will definitely, I will definitely promote it on on my social media. But oh, that's so just, funny. Just knowing a lot of the people I work for, they won't take. The I don't time know if day. Corey's going to listen to it. So <laughs> I, li- I understand. <laughs> I listen, I listen to them all at, at like double speed while I edit, and then real time once I'm done. Do we sound like chipmunks? Yes, that's fine. But it's the only way. I, I mean, editing it in real time is a nightmare. Yeah. I'm learning a lot about the music industry being on this podcast from Corey because it's just one of his passions and uh, I'm learning that touring is really the place where artists make their money absolutely not so much especially now not so much in music sales and and I was just um listening to something and they were talking about how I think it was the Eagles I'm not really sure who it was but they were the first band to charge a hundred dollars I think it was 1976 a hundred dollars a ticket Mm mm-hmm and not only did they charge $100 a ticket in 1976, but it was one of the first bands who started asking for pieces of the parking fees and the like the concession fees. I don't know if you're mixing up the Eagles am. with Led Zeppelin. I, I, pr- I could be. Because both those stories could come from either band? Could be either, because they were both of them were being spoken about. So yeah, they but Led bled Zeppelin into was the band that would... Their manager would seek almost unreasonable uh, financial um, percentages. From uh, every aspect of the venue, but just trying to make Like Zeppelin was the first band to fly in an airplane. Really? Like to have their own. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Not fly, but to have their own airplane, like to own, like it was a thing. You probably um, saved money in the long run <coughs> if you're if you're Led Zeppelin. I don't think Led Zeppelin was about saving any money <laughs> at all. I, I, I st- to this day don't think they would have to even now. Uh, maybe now because there's a lot of people they have to pay for their songs. <laughs> they have to pay for their songs. Well, they've been sued so many times that if you if you look at the original records, it'll see it it it'll show you like written by Page Plant or Page Jones, Bonham, whatever. Mm-hmm. Now there's like eight artists because they were taking literally lifting entire songs or massive portions of songs from uh, Delta Blues artists in in uh, oh before like South. it was a thing where you could yeah. just quickly check it yeah so now they they and they pay royalties to their families now what yeah. that's a really interesting music fact yeah huh. and there's still a debate about the song by Spirit and. Led Zeppelin, uh, Stairway to Heaven, sounds like this song by Spirit. I think that was the name of the band, Spirit. And uh, they lost the original lawsuit, Spirit did, but now I guess it's back on or something. I don't know. You don't know. (laughs) Ryan, explain to me this as best you can. No judgment involved here. Why would it cost $1,000 to go see a musician, a band? Uh, As an audience member, spending $1,000 on the ticket? On a seat. Um, I'd imagine if you're going to spend a thousand dollars, that's going to be a very good seat. Um, but you're really paying for people when they go to a concert. Now they're not just going to listen to music anymore. Um, more or less, there are still some shows that are more music based, but when you go to go see a large scale production like Beyonce or Madonna, Mm -hmm. you're, you're paying for the the experience. Um, Mm. you're paying for seeing an insane light show. You're paying to, to watch awesome visuals on, on the giant led screens that they have. You're paying to see the pyrotechnic Mm -hmm. that they have. That's all 
in conjunction with, with and you're the paying music. that giant crew that puts and it yeah, all together. You're, you're, you're paying for about 30 <laughs> semi trucks worth of gear as well. Uh huh. So you're saying it's justified by the the experience of the show. So a thousand dollars. Well, the experience of the show costs money because the expense of putting that experience together. So think think of what the what it costs to move thirty one. I'm just trying to fathom paying a thousand dollars to see a concert, and it's a thing. My my wife and daughter just bought three three or four tickets to see Harry Styles. Right on in Boston, for I don't even want to say. How don't much. say it because don't say it. But a, I mean, it's a, the a holidays. A good grip of money, yeah. You know, but the and they paid Ticketmaster prices when they got released. And their tickets now on the resale market are like three, four times as much as they paid. So I think they paid, let's say, say they paid 300 per By ticket. By resale, you mean I bought them right away and now I now, can sell them on, on Facebook for triple that or something. Sca- not like, scalping. Is it still called scalping? Not scalping. No, it's 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 a uh, the, the third-party market or resale market. Like, okay, uh, like I can't like make it. Who wants these? Yeah. Um, their their tickets are going for eleven twelve hundred a piece, and people pay, we'll it. pay it. So does that price include a VIP pass or a meet and greet or a? It it could it sometimes could. there are there are tickets that cost a thousand dollars. I know uh, some of the artists I work for. I mean the the ticket price isn't nearly a thousand dollars, but we do have a higher tier tier ticket for a meet and greet uh, where you actually get to meet the artist and you get like a signed piece of merchandise. Uh, in a in a photo, artists must love meet and greets. Absolutely, it's it's a big money maker because the ma- uh, the vast majority of that goes directly to the artist right. instead of going getting split up between the venue and the artist and anyone else that could possibly be taking a commission on just the general ticket sale. Yeah. So he, I mean, one one of the the easiest solutions for fans, to, if you want the ticket prices to come down. Start buying records again. <laughs> well, they're getting such a little cut of the record. Well, they're getting a little cut of the streaming, but physical product will still give the largest cut. How much, how much you want to bet if people start buying records, ticket prices won't come down for concerts? How it much ne- you want to bet go, that nobody's gonna, nobody is going to <laughs> buy, buy album. enough albums anymore? It's, different, to, it's a different time. Yes. It's a different time, space, technology. It, also, most of, most of the contracts that a lot of the new artists that are signing um, with these larger record labels are so heavily in the favor of the record label that they don't really see a whole lot of a percentage coming back from Correct. actual record sales. Um, what will happen is when a record label will sign a new artist... Um, They'll usually give them a very large signing bonus, but all of that is recoupable back to the to the label. So any any amount of money that they make off of that record has to go to the record label to make up for the advance that they've given that artist. So it's basically a loan. More or less, they're forwarding it to them. Yeah. Yep. And who eats it if it does, if they don't make back that money? The record uh, the, label. The record label. So they're taking a little bit of the chance. Essentially. So artists also can make money with endorsements, obviously. Of course. Okay. Yep. So there's there's money to be made, and it's not it necessarily also, through streaming it music, also, which most people do. It also depends on the type of contract that uh, an artist either signs with their record label or with their management company. Um, if an artist signs a contract that's very very heavy towards towards the label or towards the management they could take a cut off of off of everything from touring percentage to any bit of merchandise they sell to any sponsorship or endorsement and if you're a manager or label that's the contract you want but if you're taylor swift you're trying to get them out of your business Mm -hmm. look at all i've learned this is why some artists uh like eminem for example he owns shady records yeah they make their own production companies yep yeah, Shady, Franco. Shady Records owns Eminem's, you know, uh, uh, publishing and uh, much easier to do once you're Eminem level, right? Rather than because yeah, that's how the well, back yeah. of your car. I mean, even after that first record, he went from uh, to yeah. But I think it was the second or third record that he when he became Slim Shady. <laughs> well, he became Slim Shady back on the Infinite record. That was like his. That One was, of his first ones. That was before he got signed by Dre. Yeah. Interesting. Do we we want Eminem's history now. It was. It's a great history. Musicians are. I frighteningly incredi- know a lot about it. They're incredibly interesting, and they're tortured. 
you know they, they just well they're have, the most sensitive people typically they, they've just had sordid pasts right? and they've lived through typically. trauma to create the artistry hmm. some of them some of them are just oh like taylor swift <laughs> she did not <laughs> no she was just really well, her dad was you know it'd be really interesting to have my 17 year old explain why she's not into taylor swift anymore it's it's almost like I guess in a nutshell, um, she's lost her woman street cred. Well, no, she's she's like grown up, so she she is an adult now. So she's no longer cool. Like she they, she can't be identified with yes. with Generation Z. Exactly. Yeah. You know now she's a millennial. No, she's no longer a Zoomer. No, she's a Generation Z. No, but she's acting as a millennial. R- now I confuse myself. <laughs> okay, boomer. she's always been a millennial. She's Taylor a millennial. Swift has always been a millennial, but, but the people who paid she, her money were Gen Z. Yeah, correct. But now they're no longer. Now they're. Oof, that hurt my head. Still. Um, yeah. So you're home for how long? You're home for Christmas. I'm home for Christmas. I'm home for six weeks, which is actually the longest chunk of time I've been home for in about a year and a half. Really? Yeah. Uh, I started off the. Uh, a year and a half ago, I left on a, on a tour with a Norwegian artist named Bernhoft. Uh-huh. Uh, and then the second that was done, I flew to Australia to do a show with Alan Stone. And it was also his wedding down in Australia. And then we flew back. country? No, I... he's, a, he's a soul R&B funk artist. Okay, I'll look him up. Um, and then I, we flew back and did a 11-week U.S. tour. Uh, and then when that was done, I was home for about two and a half weeks. And then I got called up uh, by an artist named Emily King. I uh, went on a, out on a tour with her. The second that was done, I went on another tour with an artist from London called Halos. And the second that was done, I flew back to Australia to do an Australian and New Zealand tour with Alan Stone. And then had about two weeks off. And then we had a, we did a week down in Mexico, had another two weeks off. We <laughs> were out with Train and the Goo Dolls for about three months. You must really like traveling. It's, yeah. Uh, I mean, like I, I, really, I really, really do like traveling. I love seeing new places, and I'm very fortunate that I get to go to all these exotic and, and crazy places and get to... See ex- it in that way. Yeah, experience so, so many different cultures. And What's your wife think people. about all your touring? Um, he actually uh, isn't... He's not, he's not upset by it because he knows that this is exactly what I want Are to be doing. Are you calling your husband your wife? No. Okay. He called... Because <laughs> he said... Well, he said he... Yeah, because your assumption of wife was she, so he corrected you and said he. I know. I know. But I was make I was then making fun of myself. <laughs> I know. I'm I'm helping. And forgive me for <laughs> assuming. Oh, it's okay. No, it's not. You know why? Because I've made this joke to myself all the time that it's 2019 and one should no longer assume just because you're a man or just because you're a woman. So I feel bad for making that assumption. He's making I'm strides. Sorry. No worries. He's making strides. No. Um. Does he get to go with you? That's a, a perk. Occasionally, yeah. Like to Mexico, yeah. Sign um, me up. Actually, I we were I wanted to bring him to Mexico, but he doesn't have uh, a current passport, so we didn't have <sighs> enough time for him to get it Is renewed. He a criminal? No. You can get that no. so fast. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, don't make that mistake again. That Australia. Was, uh, I would love to bring him out to Australia. It's just so expensive. It is. It's a, a round trip ticket is probably about twenty five hundred dollars. But you guys handle the relationship and all the fires with yeah. all the touring and everything. Yeah, and FaceTime and text messaging and phone calls are are great. FaceTime is is a wonder wonderful tool. I'm so happy that exists now. But it is when Face- I when I'm home, I too. I really try to be present in in our life. Um, even though I am in my office usually from nine to five every day <laughs> working on touring stuff, but the second he gets home, can actually concentrate on being home and spending time together. You know, nice. relationships are set up the way that they're set up for a reason. Yeah. You're both comfortable that way, yeah. and if you change it, it might not be the same. Like if all of a sudden you were home for you know six months, by the end of the six <laughs> months you might want to choke well, each other. He would probably want to kill me. I don't know what I'm talking about though. Of course, <laughs> that, I mean that happened to me. I used to work a second shift gig. And I was in a, the relationship I was in uh, previous to my marriage. Um, I worked second shift for, I don't know, six months or you so. You just get used to that. And then I got changed to first shift, regular, regular shift. <laughs> and and it, it screwed up her dynamic. It's true. So much that neither of us knew how to handle it because 
I was like, oh, great. We get to spend all kinds of time together. And she's like, three days later, <laughs> get out of my space. Three days. It was like, <laughs> it was the the Monday following the weekend. Like the weekends were normal because. You're used to that. And then, and our relationship just that Tuesday, we're like, all right, forget it. It's over. It was literally that fast. Make, we can't make this work. <laughs> Some relationships are, are heaven forever on two hours a week spending together you know and some are, are it depends on the dynamic so if that works for you is he in this uh, similar industry you. no actually oh I good mean, he's a he's a huge music fan and music supporter um he actually sings with the connecticut gay men's chorus which i actually flew home for uh just to see i flew home for 12 hours to see their performance uh this patent uh, two weekends ago so you have similar interests in the arts yeah that's cool and obviously the hours you spend home and don't spend home work out yeah Good. It, it i mean we we definitely have our our relationship troubles as any any relationship does how long right? have you been together uh coming up on nine years okay that's, yeah. a, that's a good that's a good amount of time six months is a good amount of time <laughs> yeah but if you're happy you're happy but in yeah, nine years is you know nine years you you've, you've seen the ugly yeah, yeah you, at you, nine years you know yeah you, you've definitely fought some battles you've definitely got some wounds and then went off on tour. That's, that works well. <laughs> when we first started seeing each other, this is this is what I was already doing. So this is this is the evil that he knows of yes. me just disappearing for for two to three months at oh, a time. Damn, you've gotten on airplanes after having a fight, haven't you? Oh, of course. Oh, that's the worst. That well, now, now they have dramatic. Now they have Wi-Fi on the flight, so you can continue yeah. the flight as you're done. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not in another thing. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remembered now that Wi-Fi is back. <laughs> <laughs> no, your friendly Wi-Fi comes back your way. Send <laughs> like you wanted to send it oh for an my hour. God. You've edited it five times. Yeah, in the meantime, you've been harboring all this like anger, and once your phone comes back, all the mean things that have been waiting to send go through. In the meantime, he's been like, "I'm really sorry about our fight. I love you." <laughs> and and they like, cross paths. You're like, "Oh no! Oh no!" Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I said that when I was still angry. <laughs> That's like so three hours yeah. ago. Oh man, what's yeah. your what's your favorite? What's your favorite experience so far? Uh, a couple of years ago, we finished an Australian tour, and then we were going to go do an entire European leg of a tour. Uh, and we had about a week off in between, and it was actually cheaper to fly everybody to Bali, Indonesia, than it was to fly everyone home and then over to Europe. So. Mm -hmm. We got a week's paid vacation nice in layover. Indonesia, which was incredible. Yeah. Oh, I bet. Yeah. It was it was uh, very eye-opening just to, to see something so like that that level of paradise and then also just... Devastation. Eat, yeah. Absolute devastation. Mm -hmm. Coinciding together, yeah. creating that, that beauty. All, I also <laughs> felt like the richest human being in the entire world when I was down there. Oh. It really changes your perspective oh, visiting a the, third world country. It really does. Because of the uh, tsunami and uh, earthquake. No, the, just the, the dynamic well, Because you said so much devastation. Yeah, I mean... Life devastation, yeah. oh, poverty, yeah, oh. there is a abject lot of, poverty. A lot of poverty. There's also... Forgive me for thinking it just was natural disasters. Well, we, devastation was a very yeah. very heavy word for poverty, but when you see it yeah, yeah, in yeah. your face like that, it kind of... Yeah, no, I get it. ...gives you a perspective yeah. that um, is necessary, Kind of like think. driving through Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Have you driven through Mississippi before? I don't recommend it. I should be more well-traveled. Maybe I'll become a tour manager and tour the world. You you don't want to do that. <laughs> I, 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 it sounds exhausting. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't think I have the patience to do it full time. I can do it like Saturday nights at College Street Music Hall, and then <laughs> if that if that scratches the itch, then good. Yeah, it, it, you would you would be bored senseless if you just decided to you know stay home and do marketing. Yeah, I I absolutely would be. I, and I would be when so that bored. moment comes, it comes. Until then, when did you enjoy. know? You wanted this is what you wanted to do. Uh, I mean, ever since I first started playing in bands and, and when I was going to Cheshire High School, uh, I always wanted to go on tour. We actually bought, I think, our senior year of high school, we bought a tour van. Uh, and right before we were about to leave on the on the tour, we actually crashed it into Lake Compounds. Oh. Um, <laughs> never got to go on the tour. We had to cancel it. Um, <laughs> That's quite quite the but yeah. I mean, I I was. Story. I started, I learned how to do sound at the space in Hamden um, and just kind of slowly started working. The at, outer space? 
uh, the regular space. Okay. Which was the original uh, of the three venues that were there. It was the all ages venue. Um, but started working my way around and I just got to interact with all these people on tour and hear their stories and it looked like a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so just kept... It's like beautiful chaos. Yeah. We yeah. just kept working my way to... to to get my chops to the level where someone would actually hire me to come out on tour to justify bringing me out on tour sure. and paying me to do it. Well, I could imagine once you get good at what you're doing, it's a commodity. Yes. Because the artists, who hires you, management or artists or both? Uh, it, it, it's different from situation to situation. Could be I've the been venue. Hired, yeah. once, once people see your quality of work, and obviously you keep things calm, you know, because the more organized it is, the, the less work they have to worry about yeah. it, then people must desire that and they're like that's what we want or if they're doing it again ryan has a healthy reputation um you know you know that i do some work in the music business Mm -hmm. and i've made a few phone calls like hey and i have friends that work in las vegas los angeles las vegas and some other that are familiar with mr drozd drozd um, yeah. And actually, most of the people I know around here also speak very highly of your skill set and your talents, which is one of the reasons I was excited to have you in because we do know a lot of the same people. Yeah. Um, but you uh, you have you have a very solid reputation and uh, a, a well known talent. Um, you know, certainly to to do the work that you do and work with artists in the manner you do, you have to have a certain patience. Yes. And personality Um, absolutely not are we talking about like type a personality or personality that you can get along with everybody yeah you you do have to be able to get along with everybody but to a certain extent you do have to there is a time where you have to call bullshit on people and and you have to stay completely organized so you can only allow people a little bit of their own you know you kind of have to know how to be a seesaw yeah like you have to know you have to know how to you know bow to the a types and then encourage the the, the but still the make type. the train on but time yeah like yeah you know you you have to know how to deal with the axel roses and and the the scott wylands the 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 arrogant guys and the, the guys who like to get too high and drunk to the guys who just need a little bit extra encouragement and, and then everything in between yeah right yeah, that's a uh, man. Um, and you even work with artists that you have to sign NDAs for. Yes. Which is a big thing in the industry where, you know, you'll get hired and you can't even. Can't talk about anything. <laughs> you don't want to give away any secrets. Yeah. Uh, that's a, a lot of that is also for for security reasons. Like you can't go posting on Facebook or Twitter. We're that here now. Yeah, that you're here. You're staying at this hotel, right? Because then stalkers, some of their stalkers, unless will you're being paid to do people. that, so yeah. the so the press shows up. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, look what happened with Sarah McLaughlin, what? for example. Uh, she had. Do you know the story about Sarah McLaughlin? I don't actually. Um, she has a. There's a famous song of hers which. Uh, is Calling in, angels. Uh, no, no, no. Um, in the eyes and of the I angels. will be the one. Do, 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 do. This is all. Uh, Possession is the name okay. of the song. Uh, Possession by Sarah McLaughlin. Good is, song. Is actually uh, about a stalker. So it's actually real words that her stalker wrote to her in letters, and she turned it into a song. That's crazy. He, If you listen to it... We listen yeah. to a lot of Sarah McLaughlin in college. If you listen to this song now, and you realize that she's r- actually singing letters that her stalker wrote... It, the song becomes completely creepy and scary. It loses the romantic edge. Totally. Do you think he's getting a percentage of those royalties? Well, he, oh. he, he sued her for that. Imagine. Of and course he did. He sued her and he lost. I believe oh, he ended up committing suicide in the end. But he... Um, That's a story. The The story of her stalker is, is nuts. And then there was, uh, there was Bjork's stalker. Do you ever heard about that guy? No. Uh can't remember his name but he made a bomb and mailed her a bomb create but he created uh all these videos of himself professing his love for her and 
the videos that are actually available on YouTube documents his fall into complete insanity because he goes from a normal looking dude like you and just unravels he just unravels and at the end he's like p- painted all red a swan dress and he mails the no he's nude <laughs> and he mails the bomb to her and then has this sign behind him that says the best of me and he proceeds to take himself out and Somebody finds the tape, watches the tape, sees him sending the bomb, and manages to get the bomb intercepted before it gets to her. And it was a live bomb. Real bomb. Like he, yeah, nuts. And those are only two examples. Oh, One I'm is sure very extreme. There are thousands oh, I'm sure. of stalkers. No, artists don't just get stalkers, but I'm sure they get like a specific type. Yes, Especially the female ones. Ma- Males oh, get them too. Yeah. too. I mean, I've been, I've, I've worked for uh, male fronted bands before where they've figured out what flight we're taking to their country. Oh, and yeah. then there's the airport is just completely mobbed with people. Yeah. I mean, that's NDAs. You don't want those to leak. Yeah. I'm, and artists I'm not fly saying under that different men names. Don't get them. I'm just, there, there, there's been like Eminem had a, wasn't it Eminem who had the woman oh, wake up? He woke up and she was in his bed. There's been I, I Sting. I think had a famous stalker. Tom Petty. That I think I don't know if there's a gender basis on stalking. I maybe think, there's not. I think there's a. a so maybe men- I was being I, sexist. I think there's a, a mental status to stalking that's kind of gender free, gender neutral, yeah, so maybe. to speak. Because it's and it's not necessarily with artists, but I do see how that is ma- it magnifies because you're just exposed to more people. Because you can just. You can just get a stalker, and I mean, I had one in college. I had one mm-hmm. when I was fourteen. You can just you can just pick up stalkers willy nilly. Not not every band is Motley Crue. Not every band right. just wants an open door policy of, you know, men or women coming through the rotating door of groupies either. Wow. I mean, backstage isn't that's real. Um, for some bands, it is. Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I think sex, it, drugs, and rock and roll. Kind I think of thing. it was more so. In the Zeppelin, in the Rolling Stones, the Led Zeppelins, 70s. The, you know, that era. I don't think it's as prevalent now. I'm sure. Yeah, the, the, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll kind of mentality is the quickest way to get fired. Like And exhausted and, and yeah. burnt out and, and you know, and arrested. Ruin, ruin, your mu- <laughs> ruin your music. So you're yeah. not having any artists giving you uh, backstage passes with... Uh, your name on it so when they score with the groupie you get an extra ten dollars at the end of the night <laughs> definitely not oh god i don't want to know i don't want to know i, I get, believe that's another van halen story i mean i even get i get mad at artists that uh will take a picture with their laminate on because there's people who will go find that picture on instagram blow yes. it up and then make a fake laminate and try to sneak backstage correct yes I don't go to concerts, so this is all... <laughs> I'm living vicariously through well, you guys. They have to change the laminates every night, so when you're, you go you know, backstage... Laminates are... The they badges. hang on a lanyard. You're going to get a sticker. And that or, gives you access or, to something, like the a sticker, press badge well, the, or... The sticker can be a press badge. It can be an all-access. It can be a very important person or will allow you to get into certain areas or all areas... Um, but you go, you get to go to the buffet. Yeah. At least what I do with mine (laughs) is, uh, I sign and date all of them and then mark what exactly that passes for. Uh, and then I have three different colors of it that people are creative. Yeah. People are creative. So backstage you'll, you'll see the, the, the poster, which will say what today's passes are and what each one's mean throughout the backstage area. And now, I mean, now even, I mean, people are bold. Well, at the Al Al uh, Rosa in uh, Ohio, where Dimebag Daryl was murdered on stage, and so was a member of his crew and uh, people in the crowd, uh, you know, you can't. I don't get. I don't blame artists when people jump on stage and they throw them off. I don't blame security when they grab people when they come on stage. I don't blame security for being aggressive at the door because. It's a different time. You, they've learned that behavior. It's protective. Yeah, it's, I mean, we maybe, were just talking about maybe. stalkers. Uh, there's, there, there's. It has happened where people have gone into venues and murdered 
artists. The, the, it happened to the American Idol girl. The girl who won American Idol or, or America's Got Talent Whatever or it was. Yeah. Yeah. Down in Orlando. Yeah. Young. I, I literally have... It's a serious thing. I have a security meeting uh, about an hour to 45 minutes before doors open at every single venue to go over the exit strategy every single show if there is an active shooter or an active terrorism. Oh, that's a whole other yeah. level. Yep. Yeah. Oh, well, look at have Las to, Vegas. Have to do it. After, you have to now. Yeah, I mean, even the Bataclan over in Paris yep. when the terrorists came in and like, hundred, I think it was like quote, a little over 100 people were murdered mm-hmm. inside that during a... What was the band that was playing? The Eagles of Death Metal or something? Yes. Yeah, the bass player tells the story about being in the bathroom and hearing the uh, the guys coming backstage shooting people and like bullets hitting the door or stuff. That's a whole different level it of happens security. Now. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's more than an obsessed fan, although it could be. Well, char- now it doesn't have to be. It could be a political statement exactly. or, a, yeah. or a, a disgruntled whatever that's why I, I never get upset with security even when they either like make a like the abandoned crew walk through metal detectors and search our bags just to make sure we don't have anything sure on us and they do the same for every person that's walking in i'm glad as, as americans we're, we're slow we're, as americans we're slow to this party yeah so if you go to um places i know specifically israel from stories but They've been getting checked for century, not centuries, for, for, for decades, going into a mall or into a movie theater. Mm-hmm. You just automatically know. It's not even a thought in their head. It's they've given up these these privacies for safety. And it's a, it's a fine line, but when you're yeah. having large groups of people together and th- there's the safety factor, there's also the, the piracy factor. I mean, there's so many levels to the security. Yeah. Whew. Yeah, Tool didn't allow cameras that they're... And a lot of artists aren't allowing cameras anymore. There are now artists that are making a huge you distraction. Sign, they're making you sign NDAs. Yeah, there's a lot of artists now and comedians that actually make you put. You, they, there's a company that has invented these bags that like magnetically seal, and you put yep. your phone in it, and then you get to hang on to the bag. But in order to look at your phone or use your phone in any capacity, you have to go out into the main lobby and have it unlocked so you can. It's about time. Yeah. That sounds. It's better than collecting the phones. And I know yeah. the the. Um, the young guy from Saturday Night Live right now, the one who was just with Ariana Grande, what's his name? Pete Davidson. Pete Davidson is having people sign NDAs. Like you can't talk about his show when you leave it. As as a fan. Yeah. Million dollar NDAs. I don't know how enforceable it is, but it's a thing now. People don't want and back in the day you wanted word of mouth, especially comedians. I don't know about Rando artists, fact but. about Pete Davidson. Are you a Pete Davidson fan? I I I don't have I haven't watched enough of his material to actually have a, a an opinion of him. Okay, you a fan is a no. I I know of him. I have I, okay. I don't know enough of his work to decide. When he does his stand up, he wears a uh, FDNY oh, for his t-shirt. Dad. Yeah, so yeah. you know the story about his dad. Oh yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Pete Davidson's dad uh, was one of the three hundred forty three firefighters on nine eleven. Oh man! So he was seven years old and. Pete Davidson was seven years old and his dad never came home. And he talks about that a lot in his comedy. And the, I mean, Christ, it's all connected to what we were just talking about with, you know, security and everything else. I mean. And also t- t- tortured souls creating art like that. Yeah. Uh, Tragedy. Yeah. That's the, that's, those are the flowers and the <laughs> phoenixes that rise from Man, the ashes. Man, in the 70s, there was mudfish backstage and there was, you know, throwing pianos out the, the hotel window. And Smashing now. Smashing TVs in hotels. Yeah. I mean, you know, my Maserati does 185, but I don't have a license. Now I don't drive, you know. Now. I lost my license. <laughs> you know, now it's, it's, you know, how to get. Well, there's that too still. There's a, there's a lighter. It's not all heavy. We've it's, we've it's we've not, just totally downered the entire there, music there industry. Is, yeah. There We're is like definitely crying. fun and party aspects to <laughs> to my job and what the music industry there's, is. And I but mean, there's there's definitely a serious side. Yeah, I mean, wow. But that's for you to take care of to the extent where the fans and musicians don't see that layer. Yeah, that's and, that's your job. And a lot of that is you your hide job. That. I mean, you wow, you even have to like, you know, that guy doesn't look right. Like, man. Ryan, see something, say something. What a, what a life you li- <laughs> leave. What a life you live. It's not Lead, it's not stressful Lead. at all. You must love it though. I do. Part I really of your do. brain is like hardwired to to endorphining off of. Wow. It. It's just, it's a massive puzzle constantly that you have to make work in order so you, to make you just, the, the, what do you to do make when the you show come, go on. What do you do when you come home? And you and you love I, your career. I do love my career. Um, when I get home, I really like to sleep and I like to cook. 
as we come to the end of the show, any advice for the guy who is like, I want to get into this? Go for it. Uh, be just be prepared to to sacrifice a lot at the beginning. <laughs> uh, be prepared to not make a whole lot of money at the very beginning. But if you stick through it and you know, really develop your skill set, you'll be able to carve out a very successful career. What's the best way to learn? Uh, learn by doing it and by asking questions. Always ask questions because you don't know everything about about anything. Yeah. As, and the technology is always changing, so you only have to sound stupid once. You only have to ask the question one time. To, to know the facts about it so or to and, learn how to do something and everybody can follow you on uh, instagram or facebook for your awesome haikus <laughs> uh, i don't do the haikus on instagram they do i do them on oh, facebook you gotta, you gotta do them on instagram i should probably do them on instagram Why don't you do the share where it goes or, or do from them one on, to the other could do them on twitter uh i'm on twitter and instagram is at make this louder one word <laughs> which is a very good sound guy handle i like it make this louder yep um well, thank you for coming in and sharing your stories with us. <laughs> Thanks again for having me. Um, no, anytime. Um, I'd love to have you in again. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I hope that somebody got something out this of this a, crazy conversation. Really fun conversation. <laughs> it was. Learn a little love, bit about the music industry. I love yes. learning different aspects that never, as a layman, will never click in my head other than listening to stories on this podcast. Yeah, I mean... I think the fun experience would be, and, and maybe Ryan can help, Bear, maybe Bear can help. I'm going to call him Bear now. Uh, maybe Ryan can help this happen. Maybe sometime there's a show nearby, and maybe we can meet up early on, and you can give Trisha some insight onto what happens as things are being prepared. Totally. We're actually, I'm going to be rolling through, um, I would say come down to New York, but New York is just such an industry city that it's a nightmare for right. me every time. Uh, but we are going to be coming through Boston at the Royale um, in March. I want to say March 5th. Um, and if you want, guys want to come check it out, we would love to have you. You want to, you want to see how the gears work backstage and stuff? I'll be turning 45. Right on. Well, maybe we should do that then, just so you can... Have a little celebration. You get you get a little bit of insight, like, oh, this is how it all goes, and you can see the little sign with the, the badges on it. Go, wow. It's amazing. And we could chat about it here. And my hair will be even grayer the next time <laughs> you see me. <laughs> well, thanks again for coming in. I love introducing Cheshire to... Uh, to cool people that live here. You know, to the, yeah, to the people that they don't even know live within the... In, the community and this is uh, one of our interesting ones thanks so much for sharing your story thank you so much for being honest about things and uh, we look forward to having you back and talking some more and uh, anything else from you enjoy your holidays and enjoy your baking thank you oh yeah bake we're gonna do a whole show sound guy baking tips <laughs> coming in 2020 baking with the bear <laughs> ah this is why you that, do the that's, rights. That's a whole new podcast. <laughs> yeah, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do Bacon with the Bear 2020. Look for it on the Cheshire cast. Great soundtrack. All right, bye. Bye. See ya. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Let's get out of here. Like now. Okay, so I'll see you later, huh? I'll give you a call. Okay, see you later, pal. Amigos, time to depart. <laughs>